listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Give God money. Myra's sitting here next to me. Hello. Dancing everyone. to the beat of the music. <clears throat> Still in a uh, exceptionally good mood after the weekend. We had uh, guests here this weekend. We had our Hanukkah celebration for Messianic Delaware. And it was a really, really good time. Um, if you haven't been to the website lately, you might want to go check us out. There's some, some stuff on there you might want to look at. Uh, don't forget when you go there, if you check out, uh, click on the link for Zero Shoes. If you actually wind up buying something from them, it helps us out. So it's just one of the things that, that we do to um, kind of help pay for what we do. And also, they are the only company I know that's producing shoes right now that are as close to barefoot as possible. I mean, their their soles are like two millimeters thick. They're, they're very, very, they give you some protection, but they're very, very thin. There's no, you know, they don't try to correct the way you walk. They let you walk the way you're designed to walk. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> also, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are still giving gifts, right? So books make a, a great gift. There's a couple there that you can look at. The, what else is on there? I don't know what else is on there. There's so much on there anymore. I don't know what's there. <laughs> but <laughs> the videos that we have that I need to start getting back into. But with so much going on right now, um, that might be another 30 or 60 days out. I've got some some stuff ready to go I just haven't put it all together yet uh, so all of that is there we're doing a lot we have a lot in the works we're very very busy but yet you know we're we're still doing our thing if you want uh, to hear more from us you, and you want us to in some way speak to a, a group that you have we can arrange to do that as well uh, through various ways. Just contact us. There's a contact page on the website. And we'll be happy to arrange something to get us to you in person. Uh, I was going to say, we wouldn't even do in person if anybody in, would like that. In person, that. <laughs> over Zoom. It depends on how you want to work that and where you are. So yeah, that is available. Do I think I have all of the... Uh, advertisements out of the way now but if you like what you hear okay you know the like button the share button whatever platform you're using to hear us we really appreciate all of those things like i said we were able to get together with some friends to celebrate hanukkah remind us really that no matter what we have done in the past no matter you know, even and i've said i said this on the podcast the other night even if we have become our own uh desolation or abomination of desolation in our own bodies we have the ability to get cleaned up and make us suitable for service to our creator and that leads me into what i want to look at today <clears throat> and it's interesting uh that this actually comes from a meme that i saw on social media not too long ago and the meme was very plain very simple it was really really simplistic and it simply said you may be the only bible that others read today and i looked at that and i said you know i know that where this comes from is a christian origin the the and there's no real problem with it because it, it's true people look at you and do things but i'm not sure that the person who actually developed the meme knows exactly how profound it really is and uh it, it's kind of funny that 
some of the things we were discussing at our Hanukkah celebration the other day led to this. And I thought, well, maybe if we're seeing it, other people need to be made aware of this as well. And of course, the, the, the actual concept of it comes from Exodus 19, 5 and 6. You know, it's almost 90 days after the mixed multitude left Egypt. The Almighty speaks to Moses and he said, now, if you're going to uh, obey my voice, if you're going to keep my covenant, you're going to be a special treasure to me above all people. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the children of Israel. And you put that into today's language. <clears throat> it's really very simple. If you promise to do the things I tell you to do, I will keep my promises to you, and that will let the rest of the world know you're very special to me, and it will make the rest of the world want to be like you. In other words, our lives should be lived in such a way that it makes unbelievers jealous. Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Somebody who... <laughs> And I, you know, the word unbeliever anymore really doesn't fit because most people acknowledge there's a God of some kind. They acknowledge, you know, they might not understand it. So we're not really talking about complete atheists here. Um, they may look, they may be very religious in their own religious system. But they're not experiencing the things that they see people who believe in the Almighty are experiencing. And that in and of itself should create a jealousy response in them. The uh, other thing is that, you know, an unbeliever wants the same thing. They, they want to see the things that believers get. They want to experience the blessings, but they don't want to go through the motions. They don't want to do what it takes to have those things. And I'm going to make some people angry. You know, my notes, it says I'm going to make them uncomfortable. And I'm going to make some people angry when I say what I'm about to say. There's a lot of believers in the world today who want a long, productive, successful, and joyous life, but they're not willing to do what it takes for them to have it. You know, it's just like, just like the unbelievers. They want that long, successful, productive, and joyous life. But they don't want to give up their lifestyle. You know, that's kind of like if somebody uh, who loves, like me, they love to eat, right? And, and they want to take in like 10,000 calories a day, exert no physical activity, and they want to be skinny. Well, that's just not going to happen, right? If you want to be thin, if you want to be healthy, you have to eat right, you have to exercise, you have to rest, you have to everything in its proper proportion, and then you can be healthy. And it's the same way with your spiritual life. If you want to experience uh, the, the things that you see uh, people experience that causes them to be uh, productive, that causes them to be successful, that causes them to have that that just content, blessed look, then you have to be able to say, I, I've got to do the things that they're doing to be able to get that. Now, we're going to look at some things here. Uh, in fact, Meyer's going to read Amos uh, 1, verses 3 through 8, and we're going to see what some of the uh, pagan people were, were doing. This is what the Lord says. For the many crimes Damascus is doing, I will punish them. They beat the people of Gilead with threshing boards that have iron teeth. So I will send fire upon the house of Hazel. That fire will destroy the strong towers of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avan. I will also destroy the king of Beth Eden. The people of Aram will be taken captive to the country of Ker, says the Lord. The 
people of Philistia, this is what the Lord says. For the many crimes Gaza is doing, I will punish them. They sold all the people of one area as slaves to Adam. So I will send a fire on the walls of Gaza. That fire will destroy the city's strong towers. I will destroy the king of the city of Ashdod. I will destroy the king of the city of Ascalon. Then I will turn against the people of the city of Ekron. I will punish the Philistines until they are all dead, says the Lord God. Now, that <clears throat> we can expect from a couple of nations, right? That, oh, they're not living right, so <laughs> we're going to send, you know, he's going to send fire down. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He goes on like this to the, the people of Phoenicia, the people of Edom, the people of Ammon, the people of Moab. And then he gets to some place we might not be expecting because he gets to the people of Judah and he gets to the people of Israel. And in 2 Amos 4 through 7, he has this to say. This is what the Lord says. For the many crimes Judah is doing, I will punish them. They rejected the teachings of the Lord. They did not keep his commands. Their ancestors followed false gods, and Judah followed those same gods. So I will send fire on Judah. It will destroy the strong towers of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For the many crimes Israel is doing, I will punish them. For silver they sell people who have done nothing wrong. They sell poor people for the price of a pair of sandals. They walk on poor people as if they were dirt. They refuse to be fair to those who are suffering. Fathers and sons have physical relations with the same woman. By doing this, they ruin my holy name. Okay. Now, um, you know, just because we can look at unbelieving people and say, oh, they deserve what they got. But you, know, we have faith. We have this thing... Uh, that God, you know, says he's going to take care of us, right? Well, the, the thing is, you know, if you are not living the example, representing the Almighty the way he chooses for you to do that, you're not upholding your end of the promise. Remember what Moses said to the people, right? Part of that covenant is... If you will hear my voice and do the, if you're going to do the things I tell you to do, then I will keep all my promises to you, right? Well, it didn't sound like the people of Judah and the people of Israel were doing that. Uh, the people of Judah rejected his teachings. They didn't keep the commands. They followed false gods. Look at what Israel was doing. They were taking slaves and selling them. That comes right out of Exodus 21, I believe, where it says you can't be a man-stealer. Because that's what it was doing. They were violating the covenant. Is that the example that you want to portray when people see how you act? They will watch the things you do, or worse, they will gossip about you. And don't you think for a second that people don't gossip about you? You'd be, you'd be amazed at some of the things that I have heard that I have done. <laughs> I, I, now, I know that sounds kind of funny, right? But you really would. It, it is amazing uh, how, I'm just going to say, it's amazing how common of a person I am if you listen to some of the gossip, right? <clears throat> Think about that. What do, what when people talk about you? When people gossip about you, what are they saying? It isn't just our Creator that sees the things we do. Even when we think no one's watching or no one cares, they watch. They care. Especially if you're consistently reminding people that you are a believer or you are a Christian. The people who project themselves as a representative of our Creator are watched, oft, or often watched, I should say, the, the closest. 
when you hide behind a church or a religion, the people around you will scrutinize every little thing you do. And when you do anything they think isn't in line with the way they think or they've been taught somebody of faith should be living or doing things that they shouldn't be doing, watch out. You need to watch out because someone will challenge you. Sometimes we need to let the crazy stuff just roll off and, and not even address it, right? Let's face it. You're going to you're not going to please everybody all the time. You know, maybe somebody said, "Oh, you need to give to this." Well, no, I don't. That's not in my uh, area of things I want to take care of, right? And they get upset with you, and they say, "Well, you so and so claims to be a believer, but they wouldn't give, uh, you know, even five dollars to this charitable cause." And that's some of this gossip. You need to let that kind of stuff just sort of roll off. You know, I, I had a, a pastor tell me, and I've mentioned this before, I had no respect for God because I didn't wear a tie to church. And I can say this much. I had a whole lot more respect for our Creator than I have for that pastor. You know, he is attempting to represent the Almighty, and he's more concerned about what I'm wearing than where I am in my faith, he's the one with a serious problem, not me. You know, he wants everyone to fit into his mold. And not everybody's going to do that. Not everybody's going to do that. And it's no different in a family or a group of uh, believers, whether it's a church, synagogue, whatever it might be, when somebody does something and they don't uh, conform to the way things, the way they think think things should be, you know, uh, sometimes we hear it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I can think of several examples where the village failed, but they were very very quick to condemn. Uh, one in particular, when I was, uh, eh, I was in my teens, there was a, a fellow who was just a little older than me, and I'm going to be quite honest. I thought he was odd. Okay, I really did. I, I, he, the way he acted, the way he presented himself, he was just a little goofy. And his family um, set no boundaries. Okay, let, let's just put it that way. They really set no boundaries for him. They, they really didn't give him any uh, limits. They didn't really give him any instruction. They didn't, it, whatever he did was okay with them. They condoned everything he did. They didn't understand him. You know, they, they were going to church every Sunday. And the, the people of the church really didn't understand him. They didn't realize how troubled he really was. Nobody did, because, you know, the people who should have been paying attention to such things, well, he's just a little odd. It's okay. You know, he can do whatever he wants just because he's just a little off. Well, he began to find a lot of solace and a lot of comfort in music, and he became a very, very good musician. He played organ, piano, in church. He was very good with wind instruments. He was very good with some other things. But because he had no boundaries, you know, he could go do whatever he wanted to do. He was involved with, with drugs for a little bit, but he, you couldn't really say he was a, an addict because he didn't go down that path. Instead, he was influenced by other unholy spirits. And... Because of that, uh, he, he entered the homosexual world, and he was one of the first persons who died of AIDS. And all of a sudden, the members of his worship community were, uh, we just knew he was a terrible person. We just knew he was evil. We just knew he was bad. All the things he was doing, his family, oh, they were terrible. They let him do whatever they, he wanted to do. Where was the village when it came to 
raise a child and teach them in the way that they should go. Where was anybody when they were willing to set, when they should have been willing to set the limits? Where was anybody? Now, he had an older sibling, loved him dearly. But that older sibling was taught, whatever he wants to do, it's okay. We have to let him go. A couple of years later, I happened to meet a young lady, and she could be described as a tomboy. You know, typical, you know, she was tough, she was rough, but she had an aptitude for working on automobiles. And it didn't matter whether it was body work, engine work, she was good at it. And her parents hated that aspect. Oh, you, you'll never fit in. You're going, always going. They never had anything good to say about her. Ever. I don't, I don't remember them ever saying anything good about her when she was alive. They degraded her to the point. Now, they didn't go to church, but they degraded her to the point, and I mean her entire family, degraded her to the point where she eventually did turn to drugs, and she was one of the first people I remember in my young life dying of an overdose. Where were the parents who were, you know, should have been recognizing the skills that this young person had, number one, and where was their support? Where was their, uh, where was their training? Where was their teaching? Where was their logic? When we think about these things, and it's not just in the families, it's not just in the families. Um, you have experienced uh, firsthand what a worship community can do to a young person who, uh, well, doesn't follow their rules, right? Right. Um, and the thing is, with you, there there was probably not as much instruction, but there was the overbearing, um, uh, what, the not uh, restrictions. There was the overbearing restriction. You can't go here because something may happen. You can't do this. But was there the instruction that went with that? Probably not. No. Not only from the parental roles, but from the group that you should have been able to look to for instruction, right? Now, I know that the doctrine of the, the denomination you were raised in, that's not incorporated into anything that they teach, right? Right. They don't, they don't teach see that's the problem with a lot of churches they don't teach young people in a way that young people can understand what they want to do is they say you can't do this because something bad might happen and and there's pastors i know that do the same thing oh we we don't allow uh raffles to be sold for fundraisers here because that's gambling right right we don't allow bingo to be played in, in even our youth group because that's gambling. We, now, you can, you can play Candyland in nursery school, but Chutes and Ladders or Monopoly, oh, no, 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 because that's, that exchanges money. So we don't teach our young people how to fit into society from a, a Christian or a, uh, even a Jewish aspect sometimes. Because we want to, we think we're protecting them when what we're actually doing is preventing them from understanding because they look around and they see, but they don't understand. We prevent them from understanding why certain things happen certain ways. So when a young girl becomes pregnant, oh, it's, that's terrible. She shouldn't have been doing that. Where was the instruction for her or the young person, the young boy who is in the same situation, right? 
what's going on with that. And it's no different than when a person, regardless of age, turns to drugs or homosexuality or anything else. There's no difference. People want to believe, when people want to think that because they're surrounded uh, by believers, that that shouldn't affect them. But if you don't have the proper instruction when you're young, all you know is, well, I shouldn't go to this dance because something might happen that shouldn't happen. Well, what? Right? What is it? But if you tell a young person, you go, but watch out for, you know, certain things. Now, when we're talking about young people of dance, you can go, but do it properly. You know, if you're going to dance with someone, this is how you do it. You give them the instructions. And you say, if it goes further than this, here's what can happen. Now, I'm going to blame the urban environment just a little bit because farm kids know. They watch animals reproduce. They know what that's all about. So they, in their mind, they know what can happen, right? They see what happens when uh, dogs and cats and, and cows and goats and sheep and horses and whatever get together. And a few weeks or months later, you have a little one to take care of. So in their mind, they know what's going on, but the urban environment is removed from that and they don't see it. And it's up to us to teach that. Typically, it's not up to me to teach it because we have all granddaughters. <laughs> it's up to you <laughs> to teach that. <laughs> I'll put that off on you. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to say this very plainly and very bluntly because everybody who hears this needs to understand. Faith doesn't prevent you from blotting your name out of the book of life. Just because you have faith, it's not a license to do whatever you want to do. So this person, even when they're raised in a, a faith-filled situation, if they don't understand what sin is, if they don't understand and comprehend the, the consequences of their actions, they're going to say, well, I love God. I love Jesus. I love this, whatever the, the, the situation might be. But bad things still happen to me. I can't understand why. I can tell you the answer to that is that the people who should have been instructing these young people, or in some cases the older people who are who may be new to that faith, they haven't been giving them the proper instruction. New Testament Christianity has done more to keep uh, women and children in an abusive relationship than any anything in the past, any other religious system in the past. Because they don't understand there are provisions for divorce. When Jesus was talking about the only the only reason for divorce is adultery, he's speaking directly about the Levitical priesthood. There was a completely different set of rules for the general population. God's universe, God's rules, my second book, I go into that and explain that. If you really want a, a pretty good overview of that, God's universe, God's rules, it's there. But the general population is treated differently than the Levitical priesthood. The, Levit the, Levit the, the Levitical priesthood, sorry about that, is held to a higher standard because they are the example to the people who are to be the example to the rest of the world. Just because you have faith doesn't mean that nothing bad will happen to you. Faith is supposed to be a reminder for you to be obedient. Faith is supposed to be the thing that gives you the desire to follow the Creator's instructions to begin with. 
unless you're placing your faith in something other than the Creator, maybe. Have you ever thought of that? Let's look at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 24. My brothers, if someone says he has faith but does nothing, his faith is worth nothing. Can faith like that save him? A brother or sister in Christ might need clothes or might need food, and you say to him, God be with you. I hope you stay warm and get plenty to eat. You say this, but you do not give that person the things he needs. Unless you help him, your words are worth nothing. This is the same with faith. If faith does nothing, then faith is dead because it is alone. Someone might say, you have faith, but I do things. Show me your faith. Your faith does nothing. I show you my faith by the things I do. You believe there is one God. Good. But the demons believe that too. And they shake with fear. You foolish person. Must you be shown that faith that does nothing is worth nothing? Abraham is our father. He was made right with God by the things he did. He offered his son Isaac to God on the altar. So you see that Abraham's faith and the things that he did work together. His faith was made perfect by what he did. This shows the full meaning of the scripture that says, Abraham believed God. God accepted Abraham's faith, and that faith made him right with God. And Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is made right with God by the things he does. He cannot be made right by faith only. Okay, now that comes from the International Children's Bible, and it's probably the best description of this I have read. Okay? <clears throat> um, if you have never seen a copy of that, it's available, and sometimes they oversimplify things, but here is really where they get it right. According to James, even the demons have faith, but their actions show that they reject the Creator. When the people around you see the things that you are doing, they are reading your Bible. They really, truly are. If you say, let me say this very, very plainly, very bluntly, if you proclaim to be a believer, you represent the Almighty while you are on earth. Are you representing his sacred word or are you representing your own belief? Are you, are you representing the one you claim to represent or are you hiding behind that so that you can live the way you want to live and not the way the creator designed you to live? Are you criticizing others for living the way our Creator designed us to live? For following His instructions? Or are you writing your own Bible? Are you someone's stumbling block because you have rejected the very thing that you claim to represent? You know, it's odd. Unbelievers look at people who are living their faith and they respect it. But I know a lot of Christians who look at people who are living their faith and they condemn them for it. Just like it said, just like James was explaining, right? You must show your faith. You must show your faith. You can't just sit in a restaurant and bow your head and expect people to say, oh, look at those people. They must be faithful especially if you're going to turn around and get angry at your server for uh, being late with the food or getting an order wrong, spilling a drink, whatever it might be. You can't put that little Christian fish on the back of your car and you know somebody riding behind you sees you cutting people off or, or having some road rage. You can't be a pastor 
and attempt to tell other people how to live if you're not living according to the instructions. That just doesn't fit. If you're not going to do what the Bible... You know, how many times have, have I said on here, right? If you're not going to do what it says, and then I hear, uh, I hear the word Christian, and, and this is what you I think. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So if we, we think about that, what's a Christian? I asked that question the other day, and the answer was somebody who supposedly follows Christ, right? They follow the words of Yeshua. Well, then why aren't they doing it? They're not teaching the young people in their village. If they're not going to do that, are they actually, you know, are, can you actually call them Christians? Because they're not doing what they claim they are trying to do. They're not accomplishing anything. All they're doing is teaching someone to live under a different religious system, something other than, than what we can read in the, the Bible. That's what they're doing. And I'm going to tell you, according to Amos, that those people will be treated no different than the pagans. They're not going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. They're going to hear, who are you and why are you here? When you reject the sacred word of our Creator, you will suffer the same punishment. But I believed in you. Yeah, so do the demons. When, when you hear this, you still have the opportunity to make sure your name is found in the book of life because you still have the opportunity to repent. If you need some help with that, you can visit Give God 90 and start with day one and start turning your life around. You can start improving your life and the lives of the people around you. You can make sure that when people gossip about you, you leave a positive impression and not a negative impression. Because let's face it, you know, it's kind of hard, even for a Christian to say, do you, do you know what? They claim they eat biblically. I thought, you know, Jesus did away with all that stuff. But, but they say, no, we should still follow God's instructions. And it sounds kind of confusing to people, doesn't it? Do you hear the irony in that? I claim to represent the creator of the universe, but I'm not following his instructions, is what they're saying. Don't be like that. It, you know, if you're going to do the, the faith walk thing, let's just call it that for a second, then do it as much as you can. You know, we spent... Last week, talking about how the Maccabees insisted that everything they did, you know, live as closely and, and they did things as closely to the law and to the covenant as possible. There were things they couldn't do, right? They couldn't make any sacrifices because that's really not part of it. That was the result of not following the covenant to start with. But they were able to live as closely as they could and look at what happened for them. They defeated the mighty Greek army. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. If you're willing to live according to the instructions, according to the way you are designed to live, then the Bible that people read in you is going to reflect the sacred word of the Creator. Anything else is not a represent, representation of our Creator, it's a representation of you.
And yes, that can confuse people sometimes because what they think God said might not be what he actually said. Don't have time to get into that today. I've gone way past how long I wanted to. But what I want you to be aware of is people are reading your Bible. Which Bible are you putting in front of them? Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Well, I hope everyone had a great Hanukkah and have a blessed week. Absolutely. Until Thursday. Uh, right now, we might look at what a blessing is. Because there's a question about that in the world today. Until Thursday, many, many blessings.